Hello and welcome. I'm Don Renfro and I'm going to be speaking about imaging of gastrointestinal complaints for approximately the next hour. Um, I'm a private practice radiologist and I work with the Radiology Associates of the Fox Valley. We're a private practice radiology group covering nine hospitals. There's over 30 radiologists in our group. And um, I work predominantly at this hospital, which is Door County Memorial Hospital in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. The hospital is a small community hospital and has a uh, license for about 25 beds. I'm the only radiologist that's in the hospital for the most part, and I'm also director of radiology. And uh, one of my jobs here is uh, also being director for Grand Rounds. Uh, during Grand Rounds, I'm responsible for um, coordinating tumor and interesting case conference, and also occasionally present conferences. What I found was that unlike uh, when I was in academic medicine at the University of Iowa and Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago. Uh, the practitioners, the, the members of the audience, were less interested in the details about physics and the fine anatomy that we could see on uh, CT scans, and they were more interested in, in general, just what imaging study to order in what circumstances. In other words, what sort of symptoms uh, uh, would lead you to obtain imaging and then what sort of disease processes could you see on that imaging and what would be the next step, uh, what diseases would you miss on imaging. Um, because of that I developed a series of lectures and this is one of those lectures uh, having to do with what study to order under what circumstances and I call this symptom based radiology. Uh, now who is this talk for? This talk is for primary care practitioners who are interested in obtaining uh, the correct imaging for their patients, the, those, those people who want to order the right study the first time, every time. This, the, um, the talk is for uh, people that order studies and uh, in general for uh, primary care uh, physicians and nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. Um, as it notes on this slide, uh, the percentage of seniors graduating from U.S. medical schools and choosing residency spots in family medicine has declined considerably over the last decade or so. Uh, for this reason and many additional reasons, it looks like nurse practitioners and physician's assistants will be uh, running primary care medicine um, uh, in the years to come. And this talk is as much to that audience as it is to primary care physicians. But of course it is also to primary care physicians. It is interesting also that in, in some cases, um, specialist physicians act as primary care physicians because of the relative shortage of primary care physicians. And I've had, uh, for example, oncologists tell me that they found information in these lectures useful because they will be taking care of an oncology patient and that patient will have symptoms outside or independent of the tumor uh, and the cancer that they have and, and those symptoms being worked up and the oncologist is functioning in that in a role as a primary care practitioner and so sometimes the um, you know the lectures may be helpful for that reason as well. Uh, just some interesting statistics uh, the GAO or Government Accounting Office said there were about 264,000 primary care physicians in the US in 2005 However, I think that probably includes an awful lot of uh, internists that practice subspecialty internal medicine and, and OBGYN doctors and so forth who are occasionally classified as primary care because the number of, uh, or the members of the um, United States uh, Academy of Family Practices, I, I believe only in the, in the 60 to 70,000 range. Um, at this, and the GAO also says as of 2007 there were 23,000 physicians assistants and about 86,000 nurse practitioners. So, uh, you have a lot of options for imaging the gastrointestinal system. Um, you have uh, ultrasound, CT, fluoroscopy with contrast material, uh, MR, nuclear medicine. Uh, you know, how do you know which t test to order? There's also the related problem of uh, what to do with the results once the test is done. At the same time, you want to order the right test the first time every time. That will allow you to take the best care of your patients. It will also make the best use of scarce medical resources. So my job here is to uh, basically go over four main points in the imaging of GI symptoms. Um, this talk will cover these four points in order to help you order the correct first test when you're evaluating patients with uh, gastrointestinal complaints. 
Point number one is that there, that's number one there, the, there are a limited number of first-line studies for gastrointestinal complaints, and those include ultrasound, CT, and fluoroscopy. There are, of course, a lot of additional studies that you could do um, if the first study is inconclusive or if it requires further elucidation. And I'll cover the second study, uh, at least in some scenarios today, um, and I also have another talk that I'll cover those, uh, these additional scenarios. The main focus today is to review the first-line studies. The second point is that ultrasound is the imaging study of choice for evaluating right upper quadrant pain and suspected acute pancreatitis. Ultrasound is the best way to figure out if somebody has a diseased gallbladder or a dilated biliary tree. Um, and in pancreatitis, the study's done not so much to see the pancreas, although that might be useful, as to exclude a reversible cause for obstruction of the pancreatic duct um, and for pancreatitis, uh, or for the patient's pancreatitis. So, in other words, you're looking for gallstone pancreatitis. Uh, the third point is that CT is the epic study of choice for what I'm going to call abdominal pain plus. I'll explain what abdominal pain plus is in a minute. Uh, of course, not all patients with abdominal pain need imaging of any kind, let alone CT, but there are many instances when they do. And I'll review the specific clinical scenarios and the associated disease processes where CT is in order. Uh, the fourth point is video fluoroscopy or a swallowing study is often the best first step to evaluate oropharyngeal dysphagia, whereas endoscopy is a plan of barium swallow for evaluation of esophageal dysphagia. And I'll go over those two terms and those two studies uh, uh, shortly. So first, there's a limited, there are a limited number of first-line studies for GI complaint, ultrasound, CT, and fluoroscopy. Uh, now, in this first segment of the talk, I'm going to briefly talk about some of the mechanics of the studies from the radiologist's point of view, and then we'll look at each modality from the patient's and the clinician's point of view. This will allow us a balanced perspective on the studies and also provide some repetition or review of material, which, as we all know, is the key to successful learning. What about ultrasound? Ultrasound, uh, it's virtually noted in every radiology textbook that you read that says anything about it, is uh, the, the key features of ultrasound. It's widely available, does not use radiation. It's typically lower in cost by a factor of at least 50% compared to CT. Uh, it's interesting that these factors have led, uh, especially in Europe, where they're a lot more concerned about radiation exposure than uh, most people are in the U.S., to a nearly universal use of these machines in physicians' offices and emergency rooms. Um, it's kind of easy to forget, too, that ultrasound, like all imaging, is subject to continual technological improvement. Machines keep getting smaller and cheaper, and although bigger machines are still better at providing the best images, uh, you find a lot of ultrasound machines now that are the size of a laptop computer with a, you know, a probe plugged into them. Uh, the software and hardware are undergoing continual refinements, including features like harmonic imaging and higher frequency transducers. These allow prettier, more accurate pictures and use of endoscopic ultrasound and so forth. Uh, from a mechanical kind of departmental standpoint, right upper quadrant for biliary colic and acute pancreatitis, this is a form that we have when patients come to our department for evaluation of right upper quadrant pain and evaluation of the biliary tree. The uh, technologists typically scan the patients looking for specific items of anatomy and they fill out this worksheet for us. Um, since the worksheet does not project all that well, uh, I've gotten rid of the header and footer part and, and uh, magnified it up a little bit here. There it is. Okay. So the tech will take a good look at the liver from a number of directions and try to get the liver in the same scan as the kidney, at least on a few pictures, because this will allow evaluation of the relative echogenicity of the liver versus the kidney. Uh, the denser and wider the liver it is, the more likely it is to be a fatty liver. And the tech will look for masses in the liver and uh, assess the portal vein and hepatic vein and check for patency and direction of flow in these structures. Uh, of course, the main focus of attention for the technologist will be the gallbladder, one of the main uh, focuses. For this organ, the lumen should be free of echoes and the wall thickness should be uniform and measure under 2 millimeters. The margin should be either against the liver or bowel and there shouldn't be any intervening fluid. The images should document all these features. The technologist will know whether the patient's tender when the probe is placed directly over the gallbladder uh, for scanning. That requires a little light pressure. That's a positive sonographic mercury sign if the patient has pain upon insonation or a little pressure on the gallbladder. Uh, the intrahepatic ducts will be included as part of the evaluation of the liver. Uh, now, the common duct is typically going to be measured uh, next to, where it's next to the portal vein. 
And th this might be either above the junction of the common hepatic duct. Remember, the common hepatic duct is formed from the right and left hepatic ducts coming together. Now, where you see it on ultrasound may be above or below where the cystic duct, duct comes in. So you can't really say for sure whether you're measuring the common hepatic duct or the common bile duct, which is below where the cystic duct comes in. The correct wording is probably common duct. Uh, so if you just see common duct in that report, that means that it's one of those two structures. Uh, regardless, the measurement should be seven millimeters at the most or below, at least in someone older than 80 years old and who still has their gallbladder. The duct can be bigger in older patients and in patients who have had their gallbladder taken out. Uh, that might be because of the uh, prior passage of stones prior to the cholecystectomy that led to the cholecystectomy and enlargement of the gallbladder duct, the common duct. Or it might be because the duct sort of tries to function like a gallbladder after the gallbladder is out and becomes a little larger and holds more bile. Um, at any rate, the pancreas uh, is often not well seen on the abdominal ultrasound, especially the tail. The body is relatively well evaluated. Um, depending on bowel contents, and longer periods of fasting are generally associated with better visualization of the pancreas. Even seeing a portion of the body and the head allows evaluation of the pancreatic duct, which is important to see in patients with a possible pancreatitis um, to make sure it's not dilated. Now the right kidney is usually included in evaluation of the right upper quadrant because a right kidney stone or a tumor or hydronephrosis can cause right upper quadrant pain. The right kidney is measured, and the technologists will document hydronephrosis and stone disease as well. Uh, how about a complete abdomen, sir? Uh, a complete abdomen ultrasound. Uh, as an alternative to a right upper quadrant ultrasound, at least in our department, another option is a so called complete ultrasound of, uh, of the abdomen. That adds a few additional structures like the contralateral left kidney, the spleen, the aorta, uh, and you'll see those structures listed in this worksheet. This study is typically done to survey the entire abdomen, and in this regard, it's really a four-second abdominal CT for most diseases, even a CT done without IV contrast. However, it can be done as a portable exam, uh, which isn't something you can say for CT. In general, this isn't really a first-line study, but I'm uh, including it here for completeness. Uh, abdominal wall for hernia. In addition to the right upper quadrant pain felt to be secondary to biliary colic or pancreatitis, there's another scenario where ultrasound can be considered a study of choice, and that's in the evaluation of suspected abdominal wall hernias. Uh, ultrasound has the advantage of being able to scan the patient in an upright position, uh, looking at processes in real time. Uh, that's a plus when you're looking for a subtle abdominal wall disruption that comes and goes. You can also uh, have a Valsalva, uh, and, and that'll help. CT can be performed in a decoup position during Valsalva to search for hernias. As long as the radiologist knows that that's what you're looking for, you can add those to the CT scan. Speaking of CT scans, CTs are involving and improving through time. Typically, the protocol is going to be set by the radiologist. Uh, of course, there's been a revolution in CT scanning over the last oh, 10, 15 years. Um, historically, at a point where a lot of people were more interested in MR because it was assumed that CT was pretty much stable or likely to lose volume as an imaging modality, the advent of multi-slice scanners kind of revolutionized the field. Uh, isotropic voxels became the norm, um, so that meant that you could scan patients with thin cuts that allowed multiplying the reformatting, and you could see nicely in any of multiple projections or surface renderings, and uh, it created beautiful pictures and really kind of revived the field of CT. Um, in addition to the issue with uh, uh, thinner slice thicknesses and this, these reconstruction techniques, the time required to do a scan drop from used to be an hour or more down to a few seconds. And most of the time scanning a patient now is really just spent prepping the patient, waiting for contrast control to go through the GI system if you need that, uh, waiting the, for the IV contrast to go through the circulatory system uh, and getting the patient on and off the table. Uh, so scanners continue to evolve and you've got 64 and 128 and now 310 slice capabilities. Uh, this allows cardiac work, and I'll talk about that in another lecture. That'll probably supplant coronary angiography and echocardiography, and this is going to result in ongoing turf battles between radiology and cardiology. It'll also allow other vascular work, including stroke evaluation, differenti differentiating reversible and irreversible areas of brain ischemia, and it'll allow better triage for treatments of, uh, for uh, intraarterial thrombolysis in those communities where that's available. And I, I do talk a little bit about that in the stroke lecture. Uh, note that for the most part, a radiologist is going to write the protocol 
for performance of a CT study taking into account the clinician's request and the patient's condition. Um, here's a CT KUB done for stone disease. As I covered in a separate talk, the main use of a CT performed without oral or IV contrast is when the clinical suspicion is relatively high for renal stone disease because of acute onset of flank pain and hematuria. Now, uh, if you have those patients and they have known stone disease, sometimes you don't even need a CT, but if you do, CTKUB is usually your study of choice. It can be done and read in a couple of minutes. Uh, it's best to perform more than a CTKUB for evaluation in GI issues. Obviously, you can see the bowel much better with some oral contrast on the inside, and it's only possible to assess many solid organ tumors fully and, and, and vascular uh, abnormalities and bowel wall lesions with some IV contrast. Therefore, most studies are going to be performed with some, con uh, uh, some combination of those two. This CTKUB with the arrows here shows you a renal stone, which was causing acute onset of left flank pain in this patient because of obstruction of the proximal ureter here. All right, routine, oral and IV for most studies. Now, uh, while the radiologist does set a protocol for CT studies of the abdomen and pelvis done for uh, GI or any other complaints, the large volume of CT studies and the necessity to improve quality by having some uniformity of the exam results in many studies being done on what could be called a, a routine basis. Um, what's that mean? Well, uh, usually it means a set amount of oral contrast, a set amount of IV contrast, set timing between the oral and IV contrast. Uh, now, positive oral contrast has uh, two main variants. There's a dilute oral barium, which is usually what you're going to use, uh, and there's dilute non-ionic contrast, which is water-soluble, and, and chemically, it's about the same as what's injected, although they flavor it and dilute it, so it's much more palatable. The water-soluble oral contrast is preferred in those cases where there's any question of contrast extravasation because of perforation, since the body can absorb the water-soluble contrast in tissues, but barium just sits there and makes them granuloma, typically. In addition, some people prefer the taste of the oral water soluble product. It's a sort of preference between a, a, a smoothie um, and some crystal light. Now, the IV contrast um, has evolved through time, and it would be easy to spend an hour talking about IV contrast. I will talk in another lecture about IV contrast, but I'm going to make a couple of observations here. One of which is that there's some recent papers that have challenged the concept of whether modern generation non-ionic water soluble contrast materials are even nephrotoxic at all. Nonetheless, most departments are going to routinely assess renal function and use a combination of features like serum creatinine, estimated glomerular filtration rate, and patient circumstances to figure out whether it's a good idea to give IV contrast or not. And then in some cases there will be a hydration protocol. Again, I'll give you another talk on this, or there's another talk on this available. Uh, uh, so either uh, hydration protocols or premedication of steroids for patient allergy. Uh, you kind of got to figure all those things out. So um, again, I'll, co I'll, topic, I'll, I'll cover that in another topic along with radiation exposure. Um, now, how about varying the oral contrast and what, what about low density contrast material? I, I said there were kind of two varieties of contrast. There's actually a little, there's another way to look at that. There's two positive contrast, barium and uh, ice, uh, you know, oral uh, IV contrast which are diluted and taken orally. Another kind of contrast is a low density contrast. Uh, now, uh, in some cases in patients with known inflammatory bowel disease or work, being worked up for small bowel inflammatory changes, uh, positive contrast in the bowel impedes visualization of inflammatory changes in the bowel wall. Uh, and you can see abnormal enhancement of the bowel wall if you have a low density contrast in the bowel instead of a high density. And there's a, there's a, manufacturers have developed a low density contrast material. There's one that's called volumen for that purpose. And the stuff works uh, well, but it tastes, if anything, worse than positive contrast material. But there is, interestingly, this one paper uh, that showed that uh, whole milk um, and uh, and particularly chocolate milk, but, but whole milk in general, is just as good at bowel distension and visualization. It's cheaper and it was a lot more preferred by the patients than was um, the uh, commercially available product. Um, so uh, we tend to use that in our department. Um, now, how about an enema? Uh, 
well, how about it now? Uh, there's uh, something that's kind of the opposite of chocolate milk, and that is an enema. For a long time in our hospital, we routinely used rectal only for those patients who had suspected diverticulitis without any IV or oral. And there's no doubt that it offers a really good look at the colon, particularly the sigmoid. Uh, because the oral contrast takes forever to get to the sigmoid, and it never really adequately distends the region. Um, of course, the mere mention of the technique often brings shudders to patients and technologists, and it's largely fallen out of favor. Uh, but I'll show you a couple of examples later where it's kind of helpful. Uh, another thing you can do on the technical side is to vary the timing of the ID contrast. Um, here's a picture out of a textbook kind of showing you some time opacity curves. Uh, we're going to make that a little bigger here, and since you still can't see it, we'll make it a little bigger yet. All right, so what are these curves telling you? What's all this about? Well, because of the ability of, to acquire a scan in a few seconds anytime you want, you can time the scans in CT to correspond to different phases of contrast opacification. Usually this is the, what the, the radiologist worries about, but just to let you know, Routine abdomen in our department is performed like this. You got an IV in the antecubital fossa, you test bowl with some saline to prove that your vessel is going to hold up to a pretty good rate of flow, like two to four seconds. Uh, you inject 75 to 100 cc's of uh, non ionic contrast, you target the aorta, and then when the density reaches about 180 Hounsfield units, indicating the bolus of contrast has reached the arterial system, the scanner typically pauses for 30 seconds and then it scans. Uh, from the base of the lungs through the symphysis for the uh, abdomen, and then it scans again eight minutes later. There's a portal venous phase delayed images. Uh, the first pass is called a portal venous phase because most more normal patients, um, that's about 60 to 90 seconds after the IV injection, and it fills up the portal veins. Uh, it's also early enough to demonstrate the arterial treat quite well for the most part. Later delayed scans helpful for evaluation of the urinary tract collecting system, including the renal pelvis and the ureter and the bladder. And it also shows you the dynamics of contrast enhancement of lesions like hemangiomas, where that can be helpful. Uh, other departments do things differently. They may contain, they may, uh, you know, they may, they may do their timing and their contrast differently or obtain different sequences. Um, now, you can vary this timing in any one of a number of ways. It's typically altered in one of these few ways. Uh, one way to vary it is to obtain a non-contrast study. And in that, you're looking for renal stones because those can be obscured by contrast, as I mentioned in the other lecture on the renal system. Uh, you're looking for solid renal tumors like adrenal ad adenomas. Uh, sometimes the pre-contrast studies will allow you to make density measurements and give you a, a great deal of specificity about your diagnosis. And you're also looking for aortic wall density to check for hematoma formation. Of course, you often don't know whether you need that non-contrast study until you have after, after you've already injected the contrast material and looked at the scan. So sometimes you have to bring the patient back later. Uh, performing all studies without an IV contrast load would probably be uh, low yield and not justify the cost or the radiation exposure. So in addition to an unenhanced study, what other things can you do? Well, you can obtain an arterial phase study. Gives you a little better look at the vessels than the portal venous phase study. You obtain that a little earlier after injection. You can obtain additional more delayed sequences. You're usually doing that to look for filling in of the mangiomas of the liver or sometimes during uh, real delayed filling of the urinary tract. If there's uh, obstruction of uh, the urinary tract, it may be very late in filling up and it might be helpful to obtain some more delayed images in that case. Okay, fluoro and plain films. What's about, what about fluoro and plain films? I've been doing a lot of talk about CT and ultrasound. Uh, well, there was a time 20 or 30 years ago when barium studies performed a large proportion of the work done in the radiology department, at least as far as patient-physician interaction, patient-radiology interaction. At that time, barium studies using oral contrast were routinely employed to evaluate mucosal disease like esophagitis, gastritis, gastric ulcers, duodenitis, duodenal ulcers, malignancies of the esophagus and stomach and proximal bowel. Barium from the other direction was used to evaluate polyps and villus adenoma and malignancies of the large bowel. Water-soluble upper GI were used post-op uh, and water-soluble enemas for both post-op and for uh, suspected diverticulitis where there might be extravasation. Uh, almost all these indications now result in ordering of different studies, either optical endoscopy or cross-sectional imaging, uh, as I'll detail elsewhere in this talk. And there are a few exceptions where varying studies in plain films are still considered the first-line exam of choice, uh, but um, it's not, not very often. 
Um, uh, how about uh, the swallowing study, the video swallowing study? Uh, now, in terms of difficulty swallowing, that's also called dysphagia, and that can result in patient complaints of inability to initiate the swallow or the sensation of swallow material being hindered in its passage in the upper GI tract someplace. Uh, now, swallowing studies are usually performed on patients with what they call oral pharyngeal dysphagia as opposed to esophageal dysphagia. Oropharyngeal dysphagia is associated with difficulty initiating the swallowing, choking, higher sensation, sensation of food getting stuck in the back of the throat and so forth. Um, now, video fluoroscopy studies are usually done with a speech pathologist. They're usually performed with a variety of substances and um, you can do them either with a C-arm or a regular fluoroscope. They're usually reported on videotape. Uh, and the speech pathologist will typically feed the patient uh, different substances like uh, very uh, uh, water with a small amount of barium in it, very thin, uh, thick ne nectar thickness or honey thickness, barium, applesauce with barium, uh, peaches with barium or some other, uh, you know, clumps of stuff with barium in them, barium on uh, graham crackers, barium on bread, barium on meat. You get the feeling of there's a lot of barium passing through. Um, there's uh, the whole idea here is to get a feel for you know, how that how that barium impregnated food is passing through the uh, oropharynx and hypopharynx into the uh, 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 proximal esophagus. We typically will also give the patient a 13 millimeter barium tablet and see how they handle that. I don't let them chew it; just have them swallow it with some water and see if it passes through. If there's any stricture anywhere. Um, now, the main report on the exam, at least in our institution, is actually from the speech pathologist, as are the recommendations for treatment. Um, and uh, yeah, I give a relatively limited report on the, on the swallowing studies. I mean, your institution may be different, but that's kind of how we do it here. Uh, how about an esophagram? Now, esophagrams are performed for esophageal dysphagia, where the patient has symptoms several seconds after initiating the swallow, and usually says the hurts down here, you know, lower, lower uh, location of pain. So most people nowadays, at least in my institution, with esophageal dysphagia are evaluated with endoscopy rather than esophageal swallowing. Uh, the esophagram, unlike the swallowing study, is performed by radiologists without a speech pathologist, and the radiologist usually performs an interprets the study, and they usually use a combination of either thick or thin barium or gas-forming crystals, and often use the pro and upright views, and you're looking for uh, normal esophageal motility and stripping away strictures, ulcerations, abnormalities of the mucosa, inflammation of the mucosa, etc. So, what about plain films? Plain films for obstruction, plain films for other reasons. Why do we use plain films? Do we use plain films? Um, plain films are usually performed supine, uh, like the one here, or and some sort of upright or acute position. And you can do plain films, of course, portably. Um, now, there's some controversy about how helpful plain films actually are because they're typically used in cases where obstructions suspected uh, or for belly pain. But even with suspected obstruction, the role may be limited, and here's why. If you have obstruction and loops of bowel are fluid filled, uh, the plain film can look normal or close enough to normal to be non-diagnostic, in which case you want to do a CT. If you have obstruction and the bowel loops are dilated with air, You'll know that on the plain film, but you'll also probably need a CT to evaluate the cause and location of the obstruction. If you have an abdominal plain film, uh, or if you have abdominal pain suspicious for, suspicious for obstruction, um, then the patient may have any of a variety of other diseases, um, and they're probably best evaluated with a CT study anyway. So all roads kind of lead to CT. Uh, you might as well start there for, and forego the plain films and cost and radiation exposure and time delay. At least that's what a lot of people think. Um, so, plain films for obstruction, maybe not. So that's point number one. There are a limited number of first-line studies for gastrointestinal complaints, ultrasound, CT, and fluoroscopy. What's point number two? Point number two, ultrasound is the imaging study of choice for right upper quadrant pain and suspected acute pancreatitis. Uh, for pancreatitis, I've listed it because it's a recommendation on the part of the American Board of Radiology. They list it as a primary uh, ultrasound as a primary diagnostic modality. Um, actually, they also note a role for CT, and it wouldn't be incorrect to perform a CT in any cases of suspected pancreatitis either, uh, 
But ultrasound has a lower cost, and it's probably pretty important to exclude gallbladder disease in these patients. Uh, and that's typically best done with ultrasound. So, you know, the recommendation typically is gallbladder or pancreas, acute pancreatitis, pancreas troubles. Consider doing your ultrasound study first. Uh, why? Well, ultrasound can show signs of gallbladder disease. Uh, it's going to include evaluation of the gallbladder, biliary tree, liver, and kidney. Um, gallbladder disease is a frequently encountered abnormality. The patients typically present with recurrent right upper quadrant pain, which can be referred to the right shoulder. Uh, pain can follow meals, particularly meals high in fat, secondary to contraction of the gallbladder, and the gallbladder attempting to empty when there's a stone lodged in the macrocystic duct. Uh, now, that stimulates autonomic nerve fibers because of either distension or muscular contraction of the gallbladder wall. And then the stone can dislodge with pain at a time, and then the pain subsides, but then it may come back at the next meal. Ultimately, smaller stones can pass all the way through the cystic duct and common duct, and then out through the gastrointestinal system, and that can lead to intermittent pain as well. Um, here's a image of a gallstone. Now, the first finding you look for in the case of someone with upper quadrant pain, right upper quadrant pain, is a gallstone or gallstones in the gallbladder. And these stones, especially if they're accompanied by a classic history and a positive physical exam, uh, finding with tenderness over the gallbladder, and a positive sonographic Murphy sign that I talked about before, or imaging findings like being lodged in the gallbladder neck, or having gallbladder wall thickening or pericholocystic fluid, there, these are pretty likely the cause of the patient's symptoms. Here's the gallstone with an arrow on it. You can see it's a filling defect in the gallbladder. It's got shadows behind it. Uh, now one thing that it's good to keep in mind that a lot of people harbor asymptomatic gallstones. And gallstones plus right upper quadrant pain may not always equal acute cholecystitis or chronic cholecystitis. But when the pain's atypical or not accompanied by other imaging features, you should at least be somewhat suspicious of alternative diagnoses like gastroenteritis, duodenitis, ulcer disease. Uh, and in these cases, sometimes you want to do, or at least consider endoscopy before surgery. How about a, uh, here's a finding of gallstone disease and gallbladder disease is a dilated biliary tree. Uh, now that finding may accompany gallbladder disease, and as I noted earlier, the typical upper limit's normal for your duct is about seven millimeters. Uh, you can see slightly larger measurements in the elderly and those who have had a polycystectomy, sometimes even 10 or 15 millimeters. Um, a dilated duct prior to cholecystectomy uh, can be from a stone downstream to where you're looking, also called cholecystectomy or it can be residual from a prior passage of a stone. And since the common duct is hard to see all the way down, sometimes you'll need additional tests like a nuclear medicine study or a magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography or MRCP, or actually MRCP, or uh, endoscopic uh, retrograde cholangiopancreatography or ERCP to evaluate patients when there's a strong suspicion of cholecystitis. Uh, the determination of whether to perform these tests is usually in uh, made by a gastroenterologist or a GI surgeon. Um, wall thickening, here seen where the arrow is. Uh, a thick gallbladder wall and pericholecystic fluid are both ultrasound imaging features that suggest inflammation, most likely from acute cholecystitis. Again, the clinical features are going to be key here if you're accompanied, if, if these uh, changes are accompanied by recurrent right upper quadrant pain and gallbladder tenderness or a sonographic Murphy sign, then this diagnosis is usually pretty obvious. The issue is a little more complicated when you've got congestive heart failure because can, uh, hepatic congestion from right sided heart failure can cause right upper quadrant pain and also lead to ascites uh, and, that, uh, and that can cause pericholecystic fluid. So, uh, heart failure can mimic gallstone disease or, or choli, uh, cholecystitis. Pancreatitis, ultrasound versus CT. I kind of talked a little bit about this before. Um, you're mostly looking for stone disease uh, as a cause of gallstone pancreatitis because that's reversible. Um, CT is going to better demonstrate inflammatory changes around the pancreas than ultrasound, typically. Uh, ultrasound does not always get a great look at the entire pancreas, especially the tail, 
and you can see that well with, uh, with the CT. But the ultrasound will show gallstones better because a lot of times the gallstones are nearly accidental bile and they're hard to see on CT. So sometimes you end up getting both tests. So if you see gallstones and pancreatitis, think strong about gallstone pancreatitis and get a surgeon or gastroenterologist involved. Now, if you have a non-distended system uh, in uh, biliary disease uh, and in, in pancreatitis, uh, I'm sorry, if you have a non-distended system in pancreatitis, that probably can be treated with bowel rest and pain relievers rather than intervention. So if you do your uh, ultrasound study, as is done here, and you see a normal appearance of the gallbladder and pancreas, and the patient has typical clinical and laboratory features of mild pancreatitis, especially uh, if there's an identifiable offending agent like alcohol, it's probably reasonable to treat the patient as having pancreatitis without necessarily doing a CT. Uh, so ultrasound, again, the, the, to summarize, is a, it's a study of choice for evaluating right for quadrant pain and suspected acute pancreatitis. So we've covered two points. Uh, number one, first step in images, a few in number. Number two, um, ultrasound for evaluation of right upper quadrant pain. So moving on, CT is the study of choice for abdominal pain plus, and this is gonna uh, involve first an explanation and some talking about abdominal pain. So uh, here's sort of the story on that. CT doesn't need to be performed in every patient with abdominal pain, of course, I'll, and I'll return to that in a moment. One way to sort out patients who may benefit from imaging and those who don't is to kind of think of the various clinical scenarios where imaging may be helpful. Now I'm talking here about acute abdominal pain, and some of these comments are germane to chronic abdominal pain, but most of them have to do with acute abdominal pain. Now one way, uh, probably the simplest way to think about pain is that it arises from stimulation of nerve fibers. The autonomic nerve fibers of the viscera react to distension, whereas uh, both these visceral nerve fibers and the somatic nerve fibers react to inflammation. Abdominal uh, uh, nerve fibers tend not to react to cutting or tearing. Therefore, the things that cause distension and inflammation lead to pain. Now, in general terms, endoscopy is going to work better for diseases which cause inflammation of the mucosal lining, whereas imaging is probably going to offer you a better look at processes that cause obstruction, especially if the obstructions resulted in distension of the obstructed structure. Uh, in many cases, obstruction also produces inflammation because the dilated structure's lining is stretched and it leaks. Uh, the contents leak into the adjacent tissue, which they irritate, inflame, and cause pain. From a clinical standpoint, it can be difficult to tell prior to the workup, which may include both endoscopy and imaging, which of the two categories of mucosal inflammation or the obstructed structure pattern that the patient fits into and uh, therefore it may be hard prospectively to tell whether to send to endoscopy or imaging. Uh, sometimes additional features can be helpful to select the test. In the scenario of abdominal pain with features collecting, suggesting biliary colic or pancreatitis, like I've just talked about, you want to do ultrasound. In other inst instances, usually CT is the imaging study of choice. So CT is helpful in the uh, evaluation of abdominal pain with features of inflammation. Like what? Well, if you have fever or an elevated white count or a high sed rate or C-reactive protein, uh, if you have that with some right upper quadrant pain or pain characteristic for acute pancreatitis, do the ultrasound. For the other quadrants, CT, generally speaking, is the study of choice. What are you looking for? Statistically, you're looking for one of a number of diseases, one of a few diseases, appendicitis. Okay, here's a picture of the right lower quadrant with the cecum uh, and the adjacent to that is a swollen appendix with a thick wall and peripancreatic or peri periappendiceal inflammatory change. Here the arrow is on the uh, abnormal appendix. Uh, now, some words about appendicitis. Appendicitis typically, as, as you know, kind of follows this course of developing pain over several hours. There may be an appendicolith that obstructs the appendix, at which time the appendix swells. Again, it's this obstruction, distension pattern. If it swells enough to where it starts leaking fluid, 
that can infect the right lower quadrant or at least inflame the right lower quadrant and you have severe pain. Uh, because the evolution of the process is typically distension, then leakage, and then pain, you usually get kind of generalized abdominal pain from the distension and then more localized pain from the inflammation. So the pain starts out generally and then ends up kind of in the right lower quadrant. Um, now, where your diagnosis is uncertain, somewhere, you're, somewhere along the spectrum, it's not absolutely typical, it's not absolutely classic, the patient has appendicitis, appendicitis. If it is, you don't really need imaging, you can just take them to surgery. But when, there's, uh, when they're early on or when the diagnosis is in doubt, CT can be helpful. It's usually the study of choice. You, you know, ideally, you would want to perform it with both oral and IV contrast, but here's the problem. If you give somebody that's nauseated and vomiting already oral contrast, they're just going to vomit them back up. Um, if you give it to them and they keep it down and you scan them and they have appendicitis and you have to take them to the OR, then they've got oral contrast and on board that puts them at risk for vomiting, aspiration, reflux, uh, pneumonia, etc. So you're kind of in a quandary as to what to do. Um, one thing that you can do is just do a CTK UV, especially if you're kind of thinking, well, it could be a renal stone, it could be appendicitis, and that'll kind of look at both of those. If people have even a little bit of fat, you can often get a diagnosis with just the unenhanced CT. Uh, and go ahead and do the operation if it's appendicitis or treat them for stone disease if that's what it is. The problem is, if you don't make a diagnosis with that unenhanced CT, you just irradiated a usually young patient for no good reason and now you're going to have to give them the oral and IV and wait anyway. So it's kind of a pickle as to what exactly to do in a lot of these patients. And, you know, the protocols will vary from location to location, and, and there is some variability of working up these patients. Um, now, ultrasound has been advocated as a, as a useful study, and the reason is it's, uh, you know, no radiation, it can be quick, and uh, it's fairly accurate in the right hands. The problem is it requires a fair amount of experience to get real good at it, and it's a little bit prone to false negatives. So the problem is if you have somebody that's pretty suspicious for appendicitis, you do the ultrasound, it's positive, you're okay, usually. Although a few false positives and positives, and you know, people are gonna be really upset. If you do the ultrasound and it's negative, what do you do? Because the patient still could have appendicitis because ultrasound is somewhat worrisome for false negatives. So you usually have to scan those patients and the ultrasound may just add expense and time to a patient that doesn't need either one of those uh, added to their workup. In young women, it's probably a good idea to do ultrasound if there's any overlap in their symptoms between ovarian torsion um, and hemorrhagic cyst or ruptured cyst. Uh, if you're looking in terms of a, either a pelvic versus a, a appendiceal abnormality, pelvic ultrasound does make sense in those cases. So, um, in summary, uh, your study of choice imaging-wise, at least in my book for appendicitis, is going to be CT, uh, preferably perform with oral and IV contrast. And you may say, well, do you really need that? Um, you know, and one conversation I remember I had with a surgeon and I said, well, you know, if, if the referring physician doesn't feel confident enough to make the diagnosis of appendicitis, maybe it makes more sense to have them refer the patient to the surgeon prior to having them come for imaging. And the surgeon agreed with me, but also said, you know, if I send the patient at that point for CT, it's because I don't know what's going on. I need all the information I can get. And so if I'm sending them, to rule out appendicitis, I really do need the contrast. So again, you can see that this continues to be sort of a uh, um, controversial area. All right, now, appendicitis in adults. Uh, in the up-to-date article by Goldberg, et cetera, or, uh, and others, um, this is a, not a picture from that article, but here's another picture of appendicitis with the arrow on a swollen, inflamed, thick-walled appendix. Um, there's some interesting information in that article. Here's some quotes from that article. A study of 1,425 consecutive patients undergoing appendectomy over a seven-year period at a single institution found that a preoperative CT scan was particularly useful in women and contributed to a significant reduction in the negative appendectomy rate of 21% down to 8%. So that's important. 
Uh, patients with a retrocecal appendix are an exception to the rule that pain eventually localizes to the right lower quadrant since the appendix doesn't come in contact with the anterior parietal peroneum that gets back into those visceral parietal uh, nerve fibers that I was talking to about before. Um, this picture is actually a retrocecal appendix and uh, the interesting thing was that this, the, the, nerve, the note from the surgeon said the pain became more severe and began to migrate to the right lower quadrant. He was brought to evaluation to the, to the pediatric clinic. Appropriate laboratories were obtained and he did not really have lupus mitosis, had a mild left shift. He did have a history suggestive of appendicitis. He had some tenderness in the right lower quadrant and a positive psoas sign. However, he did not have peritoneal type tenderness. That's why we proceeded to CT and the CT scan was confirmatory. So here's some more up-to-date quotes. Uh, microscopic hematuria and pyuria was found in up to a third of patients with acute appendicitis. That would get confusing in terms of pyelonephritis versus appendicitis. 30% of patients with acute appendicitis have a normal white blood count, 30%, so that can be confusing. Um, a systematic review estimated that in adults and adolescents with a suspected appendicitis, the overall sensitivity of CT was 0.94. Specificity 0.95, so it's a pretty good test. Okay, how about diverticulitis? Diverticulitis abnormal uh, bowel in the right uh, left lower quadrant, um, along with some associated inflammation, um, fat stranding, probably an early abscess forming there where that arrow is. Uh, just like renal, just like gallstone disease and renal colic. Diverticulitis typically follows an obstruction. In diverticulitis, the obstruction is at the lumen of the diverticular where it communicates with the bowel. Uh, a little fecalith or turd ball gets stuck in that lumen, and then the diverticulum swells and leaks. That causes periodontal uh, inflammation and associated fat stranding, or kind of, frankly, rupture, leading to greater degrees of inflammation and free air or abscess formation. Bowel wall thickening may be secondary to inflammation, but sometimes you'll see thickening just because of circle muscle hypertrophy that occurs secondary to chronic diverticulosis. Uh, since most of these diverticular are in the sigmoid colon, most of the patients have low pelvic pain. Uh, but diverticular diverticulitis can occur anywhere along the course of the large bowel. Um, now most of, most of these patients are going to have changes in bowel habit, but, habits, but sometimes they don't. They simply come in with the pain. Um, Whereas most of the time, diverticulitis kind of preferentially affects the elderly. I'm seeing this in more and more younger patients in, in their 30s, even into their 20s, and that's probably because of changes in diet uh, with lower residue diets, higher amounts of refined food. Um, usually, uh, these patients get evaluated with CT performed with oral and IV contrast, but oral doesn't really do a very good job of filling the colon. Um, even though nobody likes the idea of either the techs or the patients um, using rectal contrast works for a while. And one, of, one of the uh, technologists that I worked with for years said that he could tell whether patients had diverticulitis by their reaction to the installation of contrast. At the time the contrast was going in, those patients with diverticulitis were always acutely painful. Um, now, inflammatory changes in the fat next to the uh, diverticulum establishes the diagnosis of diverticulitis and usually those treatment, those patients need treatment with antibiotics. Uh, you will also need to scope those patients, not really for the diverticulum, but to make sure there isn't a coexistent tumor in that segment of the colon. Uh, large perforations that have extraluminal air, so-called macro perforations, uh, or abscesses, those should probably undergo emergent surgical consultation and need to be usually admitted to the hospital. People with micro perforations or just some inflammatory changes in fat without large amounts of air abscess can usually be treated with you know some kind of mild bowel rest or IV, uh, or I'm sorry, for oral antibiotics rather than being admitted. Um, sometimes the patients with the abscesses will have uh, temporizing treatment with IV antibiotics and a surgical drain placed prior to definitive surgery. A lot of times a surgeon likes to try to cool these patients off, get the bowel sterilized so they can do a, like a one-phase procedure where they just take out the bad segment of the colon. If they have to go in while it's acutely infected and there's bacteria all over the place and they haven't been able to sterilize the bowel or at least clean it up somewhat, 
they usually have to do a two-phase study or, or a two-phase procedure where they resect a segment of bowel and bring out an ostomy and then have to come back in later. So uh, they, they, they really would prefer not to do that. Now, oral versus rectal, uh, this is an example of oral contrast on our left and rectal contrast on our right. And you get the feeling, you know, you can see much better the bowel wall and distend the bowel wall better and get a good feeling for how thickened the bowel wall is and how abnormal it is. Here's an arrow showing the abnormal segment of sigmoid colon in the lower pelvis. Now, how about uh, up-to-date? Up-to-date, of course, is that superb online resource that's uh, up updated quite frequently and has excellent um, uh, current information on all these disease processes. In um, the article by Young, Faduk, et al., uh, these are some quotes out of that article about diverticulitis. Complicated diverticulitis refers to the presence of an abscess, fistula, obstruction, or perforation while simple diverticulitis refers to inflammation in the absence of these complications. And again, complicated usually means admission, surgical consultation, GI consultation, IV antibiotics, um, early intervention. Um, simple diverticulitis, you know, probably treatable with oral antibiotics on an outpatient basis if the patient isn't too sick. Um, another quote, 45% of patients will have a normal white count. Again, like appendicitis, that can be confusing. Uh, another quote, your analysis may reveal sterile pyuria induced by adjacent inflammation. So another confusing feature. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the second talk on GI symptoms. And finally, uh, the other inflammatory process that you can diagnose on CT is appendagitis apoploicae. Uh, this image is uh, two scans done of the same patient several months apart. The one on our left was done uh, for an independent reason not related to his bowel. The one on the right, he came in with uh, uh, left lower quadrant pain for all the world, typical for diverticulitis. Here the arrow is on the pristine, non-inflamed fat next to the descending colon on our, on our left. On our right, the arrow shows you the area of appendagitis epiploicae uh, adjacent to the non-inflamed bowel with a little bit of inflammation along the wall of the bowel. The blue arrow shows uh, the key finding in this diagnosis, which is that central little pocket of fat. Um, what is appendagitis epiploicae? Well, it's a self-limited entity. It was probably underdiagnosed in the past because it often resolves without the necessity of surgery, so there's often not any correlating pathology. The widespread use of CT in the evaluations of, uh, of patients with acute abdominal pain and features of inflammation has resulted in the diagnosis uh, being made more frequently. It follows torsion of the epiploic appendages, which are little fatty outpouchings along the bowel margin. As those twist, then they infarct, and then you get the characteristic CT picture of inflammation around the little piece of fat. Um, these patients pretty much always respond to conservative measures, which are basically pain relievers. It's not an infectious process. It's uh, ischemic slash infarction process. And they usually have pretty prompt resolution of their symptoms. Um, the patient in this case, uh, his symptoms were resolved with oral pain med uh, uh, medication. Uh, what does it say in up-to-date? Uh, here's a quote out of this up-to-date article. Epiploic uh, epi appendagitis is a benign and self-limited condition uh, in which abdominal CT scan appearance can lead to a confident diagnosis. Patients can be managed conservatively with oral anti-inflammatory medications and occasionally a short course of opioids. All right, a few more topics to cover here. CT with abdominal pain plus. There are other things in addition to inflammation. You can have obstruction, a mass, weight loss, or diarrhea. And I'm gonna kind of hit the high points here because there's a, you know, there's a ton of different processes you can see in the abdomen. Uh, I just want to kind of emphasize a few main points with each one of these. Um, when you have uh, distension and nausea and vomiting and you're thinking in terms of a bowel obstruction, CT can be very helpful because it can help you find uh, a lead point uh, in the, and, and, the, and the lead point or the point where the, the bowel goes from one uh, 
one caliber to, the, uh, to another caliber is important uh, to diagnose the cause of obstruction. Um, there's ongoing debate about the utility of plain films. Sometimes you'll see air fluid levels, but again, you can have false negative plain films and you need to do the CT anyway. Uh, often CT will show you both the cause and the location of the obstruction, and the key to the diagnosis is typically the transition point. Uh, sometimes there's a hernia or volvulus or mass at the transition point. Sometimes there's inflammatory change there. Sometimes it's where there's been surgery, so you think there's a stricture there. Um, in this case, uh, we had an abdominal pain with distension, suspicious for obstruction. The white arrow is on a distended bowel loop, um, and this was a post-operative stricture. Um, here the white arrow is on the distended bowel, the blue arrow is at the location of the bowel wall where the patient had some vascular surgery done and then come in through the interabdominal wall, uh, I kind of misspoke, it's actually the interabdominal wall, not the bowel wall that they came in from. And uh, you can see right there where that, if you kind of trace this through on sequential images, that was where the obstruction was. Uh, the blue arrow is at the level of the, uh, uh, the transition point. In this slide, the red arrow shows you uh, the prior vascular surgery where they've done an abdominal aortic repair. And then finally, we've got, just to complete the color scheme, a surgical scar above the apparent transition point in the subacute fat where this yellow arrow is. This is an abdominal pain, and the patient actually had a palpable mass. Um, he had a history of prior interabdominal wall hernia repair. Here, you've got a white arrow on the plain film where there's a kind of a bulge in the abdominal wall. That's not really all that helpful. Um, on the CT scan, coronal reconstruction, you've got blue arrows where there's a bowel loop herniating through the bowel wall. This cross-sectional image, uh, um, slide 156, shows loops of bowel extending outside the abdominal wall. Um, this slide has a white arrow on mesh in the intra-abdominal wall where there was a hernia repair. At the edge of that hernia repair, there's been another hernia occur. The blue arrow was on the uh, efferent loop coming out of there, which is collapsed. So there's bowel that goes, it's kind of a roach motel hernia. The bowel uh, contents go in, but they don't come out. So it's functioned as a... Uh, uh, an obstruction. So in, in the obstructive process, CT can be very helpful uh, in distinguishing the cause, location of obstruction. Uh, abdominal pain with weight loss, you really have to think about neoplasm. This unfortunate gentleman had had abdominal pain and weight loss for several months and had an endoscopy done. That was negative. Uh, he was actually sent for a CT scan uh, to try to figure out whether he had intestinal angina or ischemia and was found to have pancreatic cancer. Um, at this point, it's kind of surrounded the uh, superior mesenteric vein, and he had a very poor prognosis and, and uh, lived about another year, year and a half. Um, how about abdominal pain with extensive diarrhea? Well, you know, diarrhea is usually a, a, a symptom uh, or a feature of a mucosal process, so a lot of times these patients either get treated without any imaging or endoscopy or an endoscopy instead of a CT, but when they do get CT, sometimes you can see some features of diseases and help sort out what's going on in patients with extensive diarrhea. This is a case of ischemic colitis. The white arrow shows you the typical so-called thumbprinting from mucosal edema in the colon and the transverse colon, and then the blue arrow shows you the extensive diffuse bowel wall thickening. Uh, in this patient. This is a patient who had been treated with, uh, um, I'm sorry, this is a patient who had, had extensive vascular disease and had ischemic colitis, bowel wall thickening, and uh, associated diarrhea. Um, what does up to date say about uh, ischemic symptoms? Well, it says in the majority of patients with colonic ischemia, a specific occluding lesion in the major artery cannot be identified. Uh, white cell counts about 20,000 in metabolic acidosis and a patient with signs and symptoms of acute colitis are really quite suggestive of, of intestinal ischemia and CT findings are usually nonspecific. Scans can be normal. Um, one of the things you're looking for is a segmental distribution with an 
trans transition between injured and non-injured or, or fat thickened mucosa, non-thickened mucosa, and you also look for uh, rectal sparing and rapid resolution. Um, you usually do supportive care in the absence of colonic gangrene or perforation with IV fluids and to try to put the colon to rest for ischemic colitis. How about pseudomembranous colitis? Uh, this, pain had, uh, this patient had extensive uh, diarrhea and she had been on antibiotics for H. pylori and developed abdominal pain and diarrhea. Here the white arrow shows an abnormal segment of sigmoid colon with a thickened wall. And the blue arrow shows uh, inflammatory fluid in the low posterior pelvis. Um, there's another image with a thickened bowel and some fluid in the lateral clonal fascia. The white arrows on the thickened bowel and the blue arrow uh, on the abnormal fluid. Um, and th this patient uh, did have pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, so these are some examples of colitis or infl inflammation of the colon, where the images will show you a thick walled colon. And if you put these together with the uh, imaging features, you can kind of get to the diagnosis. I'm sorry, if you put the imaging features together with the clinical features, you can get to the diagnosis. And probably more importantly, you can sort of gauge the extent of the disease and, and, and how bad it is. Uh, really completely infarcted the bowel where you've got a lot of gangrene in the wall, a gas in the wall, or is it something where you can salvage the wall with some um, rest and, and IV fluids and whatnot. Okay. Um, CT doesn't need to be performed in every patient with abdominal pain. Uh, I've just talked about a bunch of scenarios where you do want to perform CT, but here's some issues to think about. If you worked up the abdominal pain with ultrasound because it's right upper quadrant, of course you're not really going to need CT for that. If you've already got a diagnosis because of an endoscopic result, you don't really need a CT with that, uh, typically. Uh, if you have what's called functional abdominal pain, and uh, that can be defined as a functional abdominal pain syndrome can be defined as uh, pain persisting greater than six months with no physiologic disease, no relation to physiologic events like meals or defecation or menzies, and, and, and the pain interferes with daily function. This pain is often chronic. It's usually been worked up previously without a diagnosis. And uh, some of these patients may end up having adhesions or endometriosis, but for the most part, if the workup's already been done, it's negative, it's not really, you know, the symptoms haven't changed, there's not a lot of point in doing it again. Um, okay, that leaves us with one of our four points. I'm going to try to cover this very quickly. Barium studies can be helpful in the evaluation of swallowing difficulties. I already talked about sort of the mechanics of this study, uh, where you do fluoroscopy with a speech pathologist. And basically, uh, you're looking to evaluate the oral pharynx and hypopharynx. You're looking for that smooth transitional flow of contrast material. There are algorithms in the literature like this one from up to date, and basically you're kind of looking through to see, you know, what sort of abnormalities the patients have with their swallowing, whether those are amenable to, uh, you know, various treatments. Now, one of the things that says in up to date that even though you can assess you know, passage from one point to another and the function of the epiglottis and retention and all these other things. When you come right down to it, uh, uh, this is a quote from UpToDate. A study of 51 consecutive dysphasic patients referred to video fluoroscopy found the reliability of the test acceptable only for penetration and aspiration. Uh, this study suggests the need for better definitions of the parameters assessed by video fluoroscopy. So basically, you know, when I'm looking at these swallowing studies and doing these with the speech pathologist, it's all very interesting, uh, but for the most part, you're just looking for this. You're looking for barium in the larynx and in the trachea or penetration and aspiration. Um, and of course, anytime you have aspiration, you've had penetration. Uh, and it's important to know this because these people are going to get pneumonia and be sick. Um, another thing that the speech pathologist may look at is pooling um, in the uh, in the vallecula and piriform sinuses, and this puts patients at risk for aspiration on a long-term basis. Um, the one, uh, the one uh, genuine diagnosis, uh, kind of the, the way I think about it anyway, the genuine diagnosis you can make with a swallowing study is a Zenker's diverticulum. Uh, this is an image of a Zenker's diverticulum here marked by the arrows, um, and these patients can have 
uh, oropharyngeal dysphagia when they feel stuff getting stuck in the back of their throat. Or they'll chew and swallow and things will get full and then they'll cough it back up, but it won't be, you know, it'll just be what they chewed. It won't be, have any bile root or any stomach acid in it. It'll just be, you know, what comes back up. And then they'll, they'll have to wait for that diverticulum to empty before they can eat because it lodges in there. You can tell this is, you know, this big lesion here is going to keep food from passing readily. Um, Esophageal studies, you can use those for esophageal dysphagia, but um, not very often, and, and, and here's why, usually those patients end up going to endoscopy. Um, in up to date, it does make some exceptions for that process, and it says if you're looking for a Zenker's diverticulum or radiation therapy uh, or a, a, a history of a caustic injury or radiation therapy, then uh, you, know, you can use the barium swallow, but you know those patients are kind of few and far between. And in general, at least in our institution, uh, we're not doing many barium swallows uh, for esophageal dysphagia. Most of those patients are uh, just going to endoscopy. So, uh, in conclusion, you have a lot of different imaging options in the gastrointestinal system in this. Uh, talk, I've tried to cover four basic points, and those include that there are a limited number of first-line studies, ultrasound, CT, fluoroscopy. Ultrasound is going to be your imaging study of choice for right at the pain and suspected acute pancreatitis. CT is the imaging study of choice for abdominal pain plus, and I went into some detail about what that means and why, why not to use CT. And then barium studies can be helpful in the evaluation of swallowing difficulties. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed this lecture.